everyone. So yes, I'm Jenny Gove. I'm a UX research lead and a manager at Google. And I'm on Twitter at Jenny LG, so please connect with me there. My talk is titled Transforming the Web, Designing from Both Sides of the Screen. And we're going to be exploring the current state of the web and talking about what websites are capable of today on mobile and desktop and how we get there. I'd like to start by acknowledging where I got half of my title from, the second part, the designing from both sides of the screen. This came from a book written back in 2001 by Ellen Isaacs, and she wrote it together with Alan Welandowski, and that tackles the collaborative work that designers and developers do together. She gave me her support to use this phrase at my request because I think it's very important what, on what I'm talking about today, about creating modern mobile web experiences and creating progressive web apps. So why the web? Well, I'm a real fan of the web because it's an open ecosystem where links can be made between the nodes out there where people can traverse from one node to the other just at a click of a button. It enables people to explore and search and it enables people to discover. Now, as you know, the web started in the early 90s and the major stores for native apps, they came along a lot later, 2008 and 2012. The web began when this technology, the smartphone, that is really well illustrated in this picture as being so pervasive in our daily activities, it didn't exist. But when the web began, the most sophisticated of mobile phones looked a bit like this. Certainly didn't yet have the internet. We've come a long way. And it was these computers that we use for accessing the web at our desks, which was really the only place we accessed the web. So the web was built for desktop originally, and in contrast, when native apps were built for mobile, they were a whole new thing. There were, there's no ultimate technical barriers to displaying desktop websites on mobile. It's a platform that can transfer devices as long as there's a browser present. Um, websites themselves don't need to be installed, of course. In contrast, apps had to be written from scratch. So in terms of user experience on mobile, because apps were written specifically for mobile, this raised the user experience bar. And um, our recent user studies have illustrated that this is actually still relevant. The web is still catching up in terms of experience. Now, that's not to say there aren't immensely great websites out there. There are. There's some websites that exceed the experience of many apps. But there is still some catching up to do in many aspects. Here's what users say about native apps. So the app is designed to be around you. It's got your order history right there. It's easily accessible. And it's probably got some sort of personalization settings. And in my experience, apps have less features than a website does. So they're very streamlined and tailored towards the end result. That same user went on to say, there's less features on an app because the goal is to get you there quickly. So as I mentioned, that's not to say there aren't great web experiences that can surpass app experiences, but there is much work to do. And then, of course, there's that long tail of the web with poorer experiences still out there. And despite the fact that poorer mobile experiences aren't surfaced at the top of search results, it's still, of course, possible to link off to find a really poor experience on the web. So this raising the bar by native apps has been actually really good for the whole ecosystem and good for the web and has motivated the newest technologies for raising the experience on the web. Now, over the years, Google has worked with the developer community and website owners to make improvements to web experiences. And we've also in included some incentives along the way um, to do so on a significant scale. So one of the things that we did was to add mobile-friendly labeling to sites to give users confidence that there would be a usable website at the end of that link and to encourage companies to do that work to make that happen. This was launched in 2004, and we had certain criteria that we wanted. So we wanted to avoid software that wasn't common on mobile devices, like Flash. We wanted to use text um, that, wasn't, that didn't require zooming. We didn't want to see pages that scrolled horizontally. Remember all this stuff? Um, and we wanted links to be placed far enough apart so users could click them easily. 
We were able to take that away in 2016 when 85% of the pages became um, much more sort of mobile optimized. And we've taken mobile optimization into account in page rankings. A big change to this was in 2005 and the press termed it mobile get on and there was a lot of concern. But in the end it was implemented without that much of a hitch and it brings significant benefits to the consumers and company alike. So if a company optimizes their website for mobile, the user is, of course, more likely to convert. So it's kind of like a win-win. The experience will be better. And because of this, Google uses this as one of the many things that they take into account for search rankings. Now, there are many activities that the web is particularly suited to, for example, explore, exploratory experiences. So when you're looking for something, in this case, like looking for cupcakes, or perhaps you're searching for a job. The web as an exploratory platform was also described by users in our study. If you're kind of like, I know I'm looking for this, then it's probably easier to go to a website and search. And this user went on to say, I have this sense that there's more products and content available on a mobile website versus an app. So the web is for discovery. People use apps particularly for very frequently occurring activities. We heard that time and time again in our studies. Examples might be parking apps or directions or commuting apps. Entertainment and media, as you all know, is, is, is very prevalent in native apps. And, me, and apps like the news for the weather and music. But if you're doing something like making large one-off purchases, you're probably unlikely to download many apps to do that. If you're in an exploratory mode, you're more likely to use the web. Now, not only have we actively worked to improve online experiences over the years, for example, advising on tap size, and font size, creating auditing tools to assess mobile optimization, but there's many folks working on browser experiences from a variety of different companies that have been developing technologies to underpin modern web experiences. And these technologies result in web experiences known now as progressive web apps. So I want to talk about this a little bit today. So I'm going to go into a few technical details and you might wonder what this has to do with UX design, but I think it's got really everything to do with UX design because the technologies are coming, enable us to design for new types of experiences on the web. So this again, harping back to my title, it needs to be a developer designer partnership. Progressive web apps is a term for all the new features and technologies of the modern web. Progressive web apps are enabled by a new set of capabilities that allow us as designers in collaboration with developers that we work with to radically improve that experience on the web that we provide for our users. So we make sure that that experience is fast. Speed is really important to this and it's something that really users notice a lot between the web and apps if a website isn't speedy. We want to make the experience ex installable with experiences like adding to the home screen and launching from the home screen so it looks and feels and behaves like an app to them. And we need to ensure web experiences are reliable in places where there are flaky connection or perhaps even no uh, connection. And we need to keep users engaged and there are things we can do now with that on the web that we couldn't do before. So let's start with fast. Users don't expect janky scrolling or slow load performance from a really good app. The web has this bad name for slow performance, particularly on mobile. And by performance, I mean in-page performance as well as low performance. So everything that we need to think about with regard to performance. Web app loading needs to be invisible, as invisible we can, as we can make it. And just like with good native apps, web apps should just work. It should just have that feeling for the user. Now, it takes a mobile web page a median time of 9.3 seconds to get to time to consistently interactive experience on a 3G connection. And to get to a page that fully loads, it takes a median time of 15.6 seconds to fully load the page and all the dependent resources on a 3G connection. Now, it is, of course, possible to take a technical approach to reducing this latency. Um, let's take Pinterest as an example. They've put a lot of work into this. So on their site, Pinterest was able to reduce their loading time for what we call first meaningful paint on the screen 
from 4.2 seconds to 1.8 seconds, and time to interactive from, 30 to, from 23 seconds to 5.6 seconds. Their measurements for what they call core engagement increased 60%. And even as compared to native apps, core metrics increased 2 to 3%. And ad revenue on their site, on their website, increased 44%. So now there's many ways you can make your site faster through auditing what resources you're sending to the user and how you're sending them and working out how you can send less. And today, as you've probably realized, there's a lot more sophistication in how we measure those different stages and phases and experiences of um, what's loading on the site than there was a couple of years ago. So here's an example from a tool that we have called, um, called Google's Lighthouse tool. And it uh, shows different types of performance me me uh, metrics, things like uh, first content for paint, time to interactive, and there's these tools available for you to use in, in collaboration with your partners and your companies. So studies have shown that you know, building the experience really helps with steep speed perception. So there's a technical part, and then there's also what we can do to help with perception, which has been studied for a long time, but again, there's new developments in that area. A colleague of mine, Mustafa Kultadu, shows the different options that we can have for this well. And he's done a mock-up of a newspaper app called Tailpiece to um, illustrate this. So in this first example, load time feels somewhat longer because the user is left waiting for content. And it shows the app in a thinking state rather than a working state. It's a well-established principle, I'm sure you're all aware, um, which many researchers and designers have pointed to before. And in this example, instead of preloading a spinner, the screen is filled with skeleton placeholders. It's better than the previous example um, used on its own in place of a preloader. It still isn't great because it still gives that feeling that there might be an error and doesn't show any context for the type of content that's coming. But we can use a mixture of skeleton screens and contextual metadata and pixelated images that partially load. And you can occupy a lot of the user's time and make that whole experience feel faster. So, so this is something that we as UX community can get very involved in. The idea is to give context to the user of what's coming, what's loading, as we load things in as quickly as we can on the technical side. So we call this um, staggering the load content. So one of the pr major principles to take away from this is displaying a system that's progressing instead of processing, right? Um, so instead of showing a spinner, brief animations can mask the loading transition to imply that that system is progressing rather than processing. And my colleague has some more design tips. So there's a great Medium article out there called Hacking User Perception that I'd strongly suggest you take a look at. Now, we understand that for some web apps, it's important that they have the same behavior as other installed apps. For example, they need to appear in the same places that other apps do on the phone and launch from the same place. They need to act in the same way. There's really no reason why the experience can't be the same for an installed app as for an installed web app as an installed native app. So in terms of integration, now when a user visits your site, you can prompt them to add the site to their home screen. A great example of this is Travago, the travel app. They launched their PWA for their progressive web app for 55 different domains globally. And you can see here when you tap add to home screen, this hits your screen immediately. And when it's added to your home screen, it's now integrated on your Android device. It's displayed in the app launcher just like your other apps are and it's part of your overall Android settings as well. So you can see that the web has become fit for the possibility of providing really great user experiences, tightly integrated with the platforms they're on and the hardware capabilities. But users need better reliability as well to sort of trust web pages and web apps. <laughs> with PWAs, we make sure that the experience always works because when it doesn't work, or it loads too slowly, then it breaks that user experience and really destroys that trust. So creating a reliable experience is really crucial. When a user taps on the home screen icon, they expect it to load instantly and reliably. That's what they're used to. So we've become used to always being online, right? 
So as much as I like this uh, cute little dinosaur, we call him the downer so often, um, you know, we should never really see him. <coughs> Imagine getting a system-generated error from an offline native app. That would seem crazy, right? And it's not just no connection that breaks the user experience. Slow and intermittent connections can be even worse. We kind of call that the Li-Fi experience. So even when, where I live, San Francisco Bay Area, believe it or not, there are areas with you know, poor cell coverage. And around London, too, you find some areas with poor cell coverage or no connectivity at all. There are many people, even in the Western world, that still use dial-up. And there are many regions that will still be on 2G until the 2020s. So it's something we need to think about and test for. And likewise, broadband um, infrastructure is poor. Many people in the United States don't have access to broadband, uh, fast broadband. And we see a similar picture in many other regions. <laughs> So there now exists, though, a technology called Service Workers. It's written in JavaScript. It's a client-sized proxy that acts as an intermediary between your web app and the outside world. And it can cache resources to ensure a really reliable experience, no matter what the network connection is, because resources can be pulled directly from the cache instead of from the network. So it also means your app can work even when there's no network connection. So this is something we need to start thinking about in our community. For us, as UX professionals, we will need to start designing for offline experiences for the web. That's a whole new realm for us to explore. Um, what is it that we want to achieve for our users when we're designing for offline web? What do we want to achieve for our companies when users get to them when they're offline or in places where there's flaky network connections? So these service workers are part of what's the core of what a progressive web app is. And they also enable push notifications, which I will um, talk about in a moment as well. Now, Trivago, that I mentioned before, shows that an investment in the uh, reliable experience really pays off. Um, Trivago used Service Worker to build a really resilient web app. And the Service Worker and the Cache API meant that the network resilience is becoming the norm for high quality web experiences. And successful sites like Trivago really embrace that. Their PWA is providing a very great business value to their company. Um, a huge increase in click throughs to hotel offers was achieved through this. And a truly engaging app though, needs to go beyond being functional and reliable and ensure that our whole experience is delightful and makes it easy for the user to do what they want. So an engaging experience starts at the very beginning with a very delightful first run experience, right? That first experience has to be great. It continues throughout all of your user journeys so that they all work perfectly without any friction. An engaging progressive web app, it uses the magic of the web. It's indexable, it's searchable, it's linkable, and it's shareable. The experience is timely, the experience is relevant and precise because it accounts for the user's context and what matters to them right now. Making an app engaging ranges from basic experiences that are imperative to get right, that we all try to get right as designers and researchers. Um, and this includes asking for permissions only when you need it, not as soon as the user opens the app, and asking people to sign in and sign up at the right time when they're appropriately invested and there's something in it for them, not just for the business that you're running. Another user experience to design, to design for now that's possible, I mentioned before, is push notifications for the web. So this example from Twitter illustrates push notifications with Twitter's progressive um, web app, which I, I also suggest you try. It's a really great progressive web app. Um, of course, we need to be, we of all people need to be conscientious and mindful when we design for schedules for notifications. We know how much harm they can do as well and what, how much damage. Um, but taking all that in mind, and you know, there's some good research out there on how to do that, what this does provide is ways for businesses who are on the web to re-engage with people in ways that they haven't been able to do before. And of course, another basic experience is, we've talked about it for years in the UX community, removing friction in forms. Many presentations have talked about this a lot before, but there's still plenty of poor experiences on the web. A recent audit that we conducted in Europe on over 400 top websites found that 42% of the top sites from 15 different countries 
didn't show the appropriate keyboard. It didn't display it for the input type. So as you know, that causes friction. It's best practice that's been out there for a long, long time. And we also found that 27 per sites didn't clearly identify which fields in the form were optional. So there's a lot of issues with that. Users might be just overwhelmed with the number of fields, or they might be trying to fill in a field that's just absolutely not applicable to them, and it might cause them to give up. So a lot of errors we see with forms can be overcome by use of and proper implementation of autofill, of course. So on the topic of integration, let's touch on new capabilities for integration for e-commerce. Digital e-commerce is a huge deal. Last year, it was worth 2.30 trillion globally, trillion dollars globally. Mobile commerce accounted for about 58, 59% of that, but it's still a really fundamental challenge for the mobile web. The web has gone mobile, but conversions on mobile are still a third lower than desktop are, so it's something we've got to work on. And it's because it's hard, it's hard to enter data on the phone still. We need better integration and e-commerce experiences. It's what I'm working now on at Google, actually. It's all about removing friction. So browsers have worked to address this with using autofill. And today on Chrome, over 9 billion forms and passwords are autofilled each month. So you need to work with your designers to make sure that all that's set up correctly so that autofill can just work. And it's great, but it's not enough. Other experiences that are important to get it right are payment experience. They need to be quick, easy, frictionless, make it easy for our customers to give us money. The Payment Request API is a W3C standard for browsers to provide an interface for users to enter payment and shipping data. And the whole point is to enable users to have really consistent experiences and for developers not to have to reinvent the wheel with this. So from whether you're like a, a tiny, you know, small business up to a really giant e-commerce store. And we're going further than this in Google, as you know, um, we're trying to make that situation where conversions are lower on mobile not be the case. We've released a payment solution that companies can use Google Pay. Um, the whole idea is it enables fast seamless checkout. It's a seamless, smooth experience, providing easy access to rewards and payments, and one spot for purchases, passes, and payment methods. Again, it's kind of meant to be a win-win, right? We're trying to make it easy for companies and easy for consumers as well. So making sure that the user experience basics that I've talked about are good, as well as making delightful experiences, perhaps personalized, context-dependent experiences with a web app are really engaging is critical. So at Google, we're working on creating progressive web app experiences that really scale. To give you an example of this, Google Search uses a PWA to make it possible for users to ask questions when they're offline, and then the answer comes on when they're back reconnected. That uses service workers, um, background sync, and also push notifications to let them know. By using service workers, they're able to reduce the number of external JavaScript requests by nearly 50%, make, keeping things fast, right? Reducing the number of user interactions um, delayed by loading JavaScript by 6%. So that's all about speed there and also keeping the user engaged. Bulletin is an interesting new way to create and share hyper-local stories, again, built around a progressive web app. It's a really tiny fraction of the size of a native app and has 100% of that functionality. They do some really neat stuff with media capture APIs for users to capture the moment and share things as simple as sharing a URL. So there's all sorts of media capabilities now available on the web that I'm not going to go into, but that's a really exciting place to explore as well, you know, with what we can do with camera, with not what we can do with VR and AR now on the web as well. And the Maps team recently shipped a progressive web app. They saw progressive web apps as being a radically new way to improve their experience for users specifically on low-end devices or in limited or flaky network conne um, connection scenarios. So many of their users were getting a light mobile experience, and those things really didn't take advantage of um, the new technologies of the mobile web, so that's why they did this. So, for the, for the Maps experience, they don't provide feature comparity with the native app, but they center around these four use, uh, core use cases that I'm showing you here. 
They wanted to make it easy to enable their users to see location and nearby landmarks, to get a sense of where they were in these areas with low connectivity, make it easy to find places or search for places on a map, make it easy for users to see what's near them and discover new places, and make it easy for users to get directions to places they weren't familiar with. So it would be great if all these improved experiences are available to users no matter what browser they use. If the browser supports it, then designers can design for it and developers can build for it. And this is becoming reality. So service workers are now supported in all these modern web browsers, including now Safari and Edge, which is relatively new. And we're adding support for all sorts of new capabilities to enhance the user experience. As you can see here, I mentioned before these new media capabilities. So that's something to check out. So that's the basics of progressive web apps. And it's exciting to hear how these are transforming the user experience. So let's take a very look at a very successful PWA that was launched by the team at Starbucks. It takes advantage of many new capabilities, makes it easy to browse the menu, customize and place an order. So let's see this in practice. So this shows clicking on an order brings up the menu. I can pick my chai latte and add that to my order. Um, and I can pick something else, Earl Grey back tea, add that to my order. And then I get to see like the um, result of that and check out using my Starbucks card, submit the order. And I hear now it's on its way with this, this information. So it's like really smooth experience in the, in, the, in the web app there. So your site not has to only load fast, it needs to feel like it loads fast. And Starbucks does this by using some placeholders until the real content is loaded, but they're working to do that very fast. Um, and so on fast networks or the, when the content's already been cached, so actually in this case on your second run, Users don't even see those placeholders. This just loads. And another aspect of the fast experience is navigating between pages. Navigations feel fast and are fast. It feels like the page doesn't really reload. Um, navigation shouldn't rely only on the network, but instead everything should be pre-cached, as I mentioned. So in getting our apps to feel and behave like other apps installed on the device, um, users can add and the we can add the install button and users can add it to their device, making it easy to access. And when installed, it launches from the same place as other apps. On, on launch, it runs full screen without an address bar and it's a top level app and uses a task switcher. So when the user adds your PWA to their home screen on Android, Chrome automatically generates an APK, which we sometimes call the web APK. And that means your app shows up in the app launcher and in your settings, where you can see the amount of storage used, permissions, and so forth. To make it reliable, PW, um, Starbucks PWA uses Workbox with a combination of different pre-caching strategies and runtime caching strategies. This ensures the key resources are always available and serve directly from the cache, so the users don't have to work, wait for the network. And then as the user uses that app, additional content is cached as they go along as an, and as they navigate the app, so they can go back to it pretty seamlessly. So while we can't place an order while we're offline, the PWA does make it possible for the user to pay for it in store, even when offline. So um, that's, that's a capability that we can use now, again, making this experience more seamless for the user. They focused on their user experience to make their progressive web app more engaging. Placing an order has to be easy for them. It's, it's critical for Starbucks, critical for their users. So the users can customize the drink with the many possible options that are available from Starbucks. So Starbucks paid attention to the fundamental details like the navigation stack, making sure the back button always does the right thing. For example, navigating down several pages, it navigates back up step by step. I'm sure you've seen these problems before, um, rather than jumping back to the home screen or some other random page. And to make the experience feel more alive, Starbucks uses content-specific animations and messaging to provide feedback to the user. So for example, after clicking to order, it shows a toast letting me know it's been added to my bag. So through creating a fast, reliable, and engaging progressive web app, Starbucks have put their customers first in developing an experience that meets the users where they are, in the context where people live, work, and play, to make simply a really convenient and delightful experience for people to order their favorite drink. 
So, um, this has really paid off for Starbucks. They've, um, they daily and monthly active users has nearly doubled from their previous experiences they had. Users are placing more orders through the web app with the number of orders growing by over 12% week over week. And because Starbucks took a responsive approach and made sure the experience works nicely on desktop, they're seeing desktop users use web app to order ahead. And so their drink is ready when they get there. Now, um, there's lots that's been done also now, and this is new this year, really, with um, progressive web apps um, for desktop as well. So we started with mobile, we've moved on to desktop. Um, so desktop use is still growing. I'm going to whiz through these slides because um, we're doing this on desktop. And I can show you that we're enabling push notifications and, um, we and web push on desktop as well. We can see we've got the um, experiences with the app window that we're making it suitable for users to support the needs of apps with flexible window organization and enable people to multitask. So we're enabling it to be easy for people to switch between um, apps using the app switcher and enabling all the general app um, window elements that you're familiar with. So um, just to move through these quickly, because I've run out of time now, um, this, you know, responsive design has been for, out for a long time, and this is critical to this whole movement, really, um, to think about how web screens might shuffle around. So here you can see the example. I might get down to something really small with weather or with um, sort of um, music, perhaps just playing the next song. So we can take that uh, responsive design to the next level to support like convertibles like Pixelbook or the Surface. And when we switch to tablet mode, we can take that into account as well, making the active window full screen. And depending on how the user holds the device, we can do it landscape or portrait. So focus on that, getting that responsive design right as well as part of your progressive web app. So what's next? Well, this is now all available for also for Windows and Linux, and Mac is coming soon. Um, for, all of these play, uh, for all of these platforms, we're adding support for keyboard shortcuts. We're badging launch icons. So users, users can be informed about important events that full notifications might not be needed for. And we're adding link capturing as well. Um, opening and install PWA when the user clicks on the link that's handled by the app. So all that's going to work. So we're going to be making announcements about this on our Chromium Bob blog. So if you're interested in this, check there. So to summarize, I wanted to take this time with you that I've had today to explain what's coming with progressive web apps. In my world, primarily it's been developers that have been you know, initiating this charge through new technologies, right? They're developing offline experiences. But I don't think that we should leave them to do that alone. I think it's down to us to start working with them because you know, we're the ones that need to define what those offline experiences can be in collaboration with with our developers. We're the ones as designers um, and researchers that need to be guiding and working together to identify those. So if we do that together and design from both sides of the screen, then I think we can take these new technology advances in mobile web and really transform the experiences that people are having on mobile websites. And with that, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to talking with you later. Thank you.